Hey, Outdoor Legal Warriors, if you've been served with a restraining order, timing is really important. And sometimes you have more time than you think. If you're interested in this area of the law, stay tuned. This is the video for you. My name is attorney Lance Fryer. I'm a defense attorney in Linwood, Washington. My law firm's been defending people charged with crimes all throughout Washington State for more than 20 years. And I'm putting out these videos to help educate the public. So if you find this useful, please like and please subscribe. More people get to see it. More people get the help they need. Now, as always, I'm just going to jump right into it. What do I mean by a restraining order? Well, under the law in Washington State, it's actually called a protection order. But Google tells me we all look at restraining orders when we search. So for the purposes of this video, we're going to call it a restraining order. But basically, a restraining order is an action that one person brings against an another person asking to have the second person, the respondent, restrained. Basically, don't have any contact with me, stay away from me, stuff like that. And the law that covers that is RCW 7.105, Revised Code of Washington 7.105. And if you've been served with the restraining order, it's going to say that all over the paperwork. On the bottom, it's going to say RCW 7.105. It's going to have definitions of things and whatnot. But when we get served with the restraining order, it's usually by the police. We get a knock on the door, knock, 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 and they go, here's this. And the officer says, I have nothing to do with it, but read it carefully. That's what the officer will say. And then oftentimes we look at that first page of the restraining order and there's a date on there. And sometimes that date is maybe the next day or two days from now or five days from now. And not only is there a restraining order, there's also going to be a petition that asks for the restraining order that the petitioner, the person asking to restrain the respondent, is filed in the court. There may also be an order to surrender weapons. So you get this big pile of paperwork you weren't expected. It may throw, out, throw you out of your house. It may keep you away from your kids. They may just take your guns right when they come to the door. And you're totally freaked out and you're worried about time. And so while timing is important in these cases, it's because they're civil cases. If there's a date that's on that protection order where they tell you they, they want you to go to court, if you don't show up at that court date, you could get a default order issued against you, which means you lose automatically. Now, we get calls on restraining orders all the time, and sometimes we're getting a call the day before the hearing or two days before the hearing, and as you might guess, someone is totally freaked out, not knowing what to do. They've never been in court. It's a big stack of paper. Well, one of the first things we ask somebody is, when were you served with that paperwork? What is the date you were served with that paperwork? Because what's not written in the paperwork is for that service to be valid, where they can actually default you, the respondent, the person who's being restrained, has to have been served a full five court days prior to the, the final hearing date. So if the final hearing date for a permanent order, and permanent doesn't mean permanent, it means one year or longer. I didn't name these things. Um, if the hearing date is, let's say, September 30th, my birthday, by the way, don't send anything, um, that means that the defendant or the respondent would have need to be served on September 23rd, okay? I know September 30th is a Monday, so the respondent would need to be served on the prior Monday, September 23rd. Actually, that's the date I'm filming. This is a, is a coincidence. So if you were served on September 24th, for a September 30th date, that's not five court days because we don't count the first court day. We're served on a Tuesday. The first court day is Wednesday, right? That's just technical things. So what's that mean, Lance? Why are you telling me this? Well, that means relax. If you weren't served a full week ahead of time, five court days ahead of time, then when you go to the hearing, you're entitled to a continuance as a matter of law. You ask for a continuance, you must be granted the continuance because you are not served properly under RCW 7.105. And why I say five court days, what if it's earlier? Maybe there's a court holiday in there. Maybe Labor Day's in there, right? If Labor Day is in there, uh, then that's going to be eight full days because it's going to take an extra day to get the five court days. So what if you were served like 10 days ahead of time and you're not ready to go? Can you still get your case continued? The answer is usually yes. Um, usually if you go to the court date and it's the first time you've been there and you ask the court for additional time either to file a response or to try to get an attorney 
the court almost always is going to grant that request. They don't have to, but the dirty little secret of the system, and maybe it's not so secret, is the system is overwhelmed by this terrible law that the legislature wrote that made it so broad and so easy for anybody to get an order on anybody else. Um, anybody can get an order on anybody because there are no checks and balances in the system, even if that's what the legislature may have wanted. There's too many of them. And so the bottom line is when an overburdened commissioner, an overburdened judge, hears a request for a continuance, almost always they're like, thank goodness. They're not going to say that, but they're in their mind, they're thank goodness. And then they will continue it because it puts it off for another day because they've got this packed calendar. Now, there's some exceptions. I'm not going to name names here, but there are certain courts that I realize and certain particular judicial officers that will be much harder on a continuance issue, and they're going to have their own reasons for that. But for the most part, um, you're going to get most continuance requests granted. And that goes for the other side, too. Oftentimes, if the petitioner wants a continuance, they're going to get their request granted as well. How long can you get for a continuance? Well, it varies by judicial officer. There's an argument in the statute that should only continue it for two weeks. Okay, there's something in the statute that says that. But the courts will often continue it longer than that unless there's an objection where somebody is saying, no, hold it to the two weeks mentioned in the statute. And why is that? It's called practicality. The court system is overwhelmed with these orders. And unless the legislature makes some changes, it's only going to get worse as the online uh, you know, publication of how to get these gets more and more broad. And of course, courts are required to accept these type of applications electronically now. And so you can get an order sitting at your kitchen table. Um, so why does time matter? Well, you're supposed to file a written response in these cases. And you need to file that response in a manner soon enough before whatever the hearing date is so the court actually has a chance to read it. If you file it the night before, they're not going to have read it. It won't even be in their computer system. You file it two days before, they probably haven't read it. They got to the computer system, they probably haven't seen it. And so you're going to need to check with the court if you can find their local rules about how long you should file responses for. Three to five days is a good rule of thumb. This is not legal advice because I don't know where your situation is. And of course, at this point, you're not my client, although I do appreciate you viewing our videos to try to become educated. Um, when you file a response, you also are required to serve the petitioner with the response, just like you were served with their petition after the fact that explains why they want an order. They have the right to see what your response is back. Some courts say you can serve that yourself by email. Some courts might think that's a violation of the order. The best practice is to have someone else serve that response on your behalf, someone who's 18 years of age or older and not a party to the matter. Take a look at the petition and you can see three or four pages in, um, it'll say an email address if the petitioner is agreeing to receive service by email. If that's blank, you might have some problems. You might have to use a process server. You might have to go to court and say, I couldn't serve it because there's no way to serve it. There was no email listed. Um, so. Um, timing. Again, why is time important? Well, while this case keeps going on, if you're restrained, when they continue the case, they're not going to change the restraints. Those restraints are going to remain just like they were when the temporary order was issued ex parte without you knowing about it. Um, they may allow for a civil standby. You have to ask the court for you to get a few things with the police there, but you can't go there on your own. Um, you may be, you know, have a loss of use of a vehicle. You may be restrained from seeing your kids, all these type of things. And so the longer the case takes, the more, uh, the more uh, length of time those restraints are going to be stay in place and restrict your freedoms. And, you know, you could get arrested if you're accused of violating it. So um, the overall uh, story here is don't panic if you have a short amount of time when you get served. You may be entitled to a con con continuance as a matter of right or you may be likely to be issued a discretionary continuance. You don't do that by submitting writing or something like that. You have to actually go to the court date by Zoom, if they allow Zoom, and that's what you choose, or in person. If, if you choose to go in person, you have to ask for it when they call the case. And when they call the case, speak up. They're checking, they, they check people in. Usually they want to know when you call the case, judge, I'll be asking for a continuance, and they'll mark you down to take you sooner. Okay, they're going to take all the cases that are fully litigated that might go on for a long time at the end to try to get more cases off of their docket early. So if you intend to ask for a continuance when you're in the court or on the Zoom and they check you in for your case, 
just politely say, Judge, uh, just for your information, um, I'll be asking for a continuance, okay? Um, and that's going to get you maybe on the Zoom platform or in court for an hour instead of three hours waiting um, until they find out at the end when they happen to get to your case. So moral of the story is um, jump on it, move quickly. Um, it's hard to find law firms to help with these things because of the speed required uh, and you know, try to get your full life story done. We do help a limited amount of people with these based upon capacity. Um, you know, I never, I don't put these videos out asking you to call me to work on the case, but certainly if you do have a problem in the protection order area and you're looking for attorney help, feel free to reach out to my firm. If we get on board, we'll listen to what happened. We'll identify a way forward and we will be there for you. Thank you.